I'm a population geneticist, and I'm particularly interested in um, estimating the parameters of human evolutionary history. And in case you're not interested, I'm going to try to make a case for why you might want to be. Um, and so what I think is really interesting about our species um, is partly that we're sort of self-obsessed, right? So one interesting thing I think to think about when we're in a university campus is how many of the buildings we've built on beautiful campuses like this one that are really devoted to the study of our own species. Right? So genetics plays a really important role in understanding human evolutionary history, but there are a number of other fields that we have to interact with as geneticists that make this um, study, I think, quite exciting. Um, but particularly, I think, what's interesting about humans is that if we think about evolutionary time, a really remarkable set of population level neutral processes have shaped human genetic variation. Um, so we might call this our population level or our demographic history. Um, our species has experienced large population size changes and dramatic population founding events that might be characterized by bottlenecks, by divergence among populations and then isolation following that. Um, Historically now, with, with next generation sequencing, we can get a handle on understanding the signatures of really recent processes, like conquest, colonization, and slavery. Um, and we've also developed technologies that have enabled us to grow and have this huge expansion to a number of different ecosystems. So I think a really important question for anyone who works with genetic data from humans is to ask, how does this really recent uh, dramatic um, Demo set of demographic events influence the fate of new mutations. And I'll talk a little bit today about how it might influence the fate of new adaptive mutations. And I think yesterday, Carlos Bustamante made a really nice case for the fact that it also will influence the fate of deleterious mutations. So it really behooves us, I think, to think about this, uh, this kind of influence of history. Okay, so um, this talk is built as a tutorial, and there might be some tutorial-esque aspects of it. But what I really want to give you a sense of is two different stories and two different statistical frameworks that we can use to gain new insight into the past from genomic data alone. So the applications will be couched in human data, but I think you'll see that they're very applicable to a range of species. The first thing I'm going to talk about how we might accurately infer demographic history simply from genomic data um, and from multi-locus sequence data specifically. And then how we can accurately localize genomic targets of adaptation just from genomic data. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is take this really broad question and restrict it a little bit further. And I'm going to say that for me, we're going to call demographic history at this moment the history of a single population. And we're going to refer to the item of interest as um, changes in human population size over time. So what I'm going to tell you about was delineated in a paper published from my group last year in genetics. Um, Julia Palacios was the first author, and I'll talk more about her later. So the goal of this work and of a number of uh, studies in genomics is to infer what's called a past population size trajectory or effective population size as a function of time. And so in case you don't know, effective population size in an idealized population that has constant size over time and random mating will correspond to the census population size, but generally it's going to be a little bit lower than the census population size. Um, and examining changes in this as a function of time will help researchers understand factors that might influence population dynamics. So how does a population respond to a dramatic change in climate? How did a population respond to an influx um, of migrants during conquest? Um, or how does it dis uh, respond to um, the arrival of a new pathogen? Okay. So to give you a sense of why this population size trajectory might be an interesting parameter to look at, I'm going to tell you a story about hepatitis C. Um, so this is a sequence-based phylogeny of hepatitis C in Egypt. Um, and we can use this phylogeny, which is built just by taking, this is, I should know the exact number of the sample size, but this is sort of a very popular data set to study in a field called phylodynamics. Um, and so this is just a phylogeny built from distances um, among these sequences. But then we can conduct a kind of inference of any of T. So I'm going to show you what that might look like, and then I'll spend the first half of the talk talking about how you might do that. 
So here we're looking at Bayesian inference of this population size trajectory from this, the sequences that were used to build this tree. This is the year 2000 on the right. This is the year 1750, um, all the way in, in the back left. Um, and what you're looking at in black is the posterior median, but then also some Bayesian credibility intervals in gray. Okay. So what's happening here? Um, we have this sort of, just let's look at the posterior median. So we um, estimate that over time, there wasn't much change in effective population size. And then suddenly there's this kind of dramatic shift in the 1900s. Um, and why did that happen? Well, around the 1920s, um, there was a new therapy that was provided to treat hepatitis C in Egypt, and it's called parenteral antischistosomal therapy. Um, it was practiced via vaccine, but unfortunately, the vaccine procedure um, involved improper sterilization and the reuse of needles. And so there was this real dramatic increase in NE that then went down um, in the 1970s when there was a transition to an oral administration of this same therapy. So the footprint of this improper sterilization still exists in Egypt. Um, in 2014, it's estimated that 10% of the population between the ages of 15 and 60 have hepatitis C in Egypt. And that kind of comes from this signature that we can get from present day um, sequences of the virus. So one interesting thing to look at that you might be noticing is that um, the measures of uncertainty are really large, right, on this population size trajectory as we go further back in time. And that's because the kind of data, the information we get from this phylogeny, there's a lot of it in the recent past because of the density of these merging events, these coalescent events among these um, sequences. But as we get further back, we have less and less information, so we have large measures of uncertainty. Okay, so let's talk about this. Um, kind of approach to inference in more detail. So this uses a really powerful approach in population genetics, which is retrospective and trying to understand the past from the history of a sample. So let's say that I have observed data and it's an alignment of N sequences. Um, then those N sequences were generated by two processes. Um, one of them I'm gonna call an ancestral process and that describes the genealogy that relates all of these sequences to each other. Because of the way that DNA is replicated and transmitted, we know that for any two DNA sequences, for any organisms, there has to, there has to be an ancestral process that relates them, which is really wonderful for us. Um, and I should say that here I'm assuming that I can separate the mutation process from the ancestral process. So we're talking about a neutral, um, a kind of neutral ancestral process here. So many of you probably know that the ancestral process we're gonna use here is a coalescent process. I'm not going to introduce this as much as I could, but if anybody would like references, I can give you great references. Um, but the process of, of generating these trees, we're just gonna use a standard coalescent process. And then if we know the genealogy, then the mutation process is just gonna be Poisson on the branch lengths of those genealogies. So we're just gonna assume that those occurred randomly in time. Okay, so these two processes are further generated by the real, true ancestral population process, and that's what our effective population size trajectory is kind of telling us about. Okay, so this is, kind of, this is our model for inference. We really wanna go back to understanding this, and we have to do it through these two things. So what does this look like if we're just thinking about one locus, like hepatitis C? Well, again, here I'm showing you an alignment of four sequences. Um, so let's pretend that where I'm showing you a letter, it's a derived mutation that's happened in this sample. And if you don't see a letter, it just means the ancestral allele is in those sequences. So I could draw a genealogy that has a high likelihood um, given these data. And it might look something like this. So maybe um, sequences one and two have coalesced somewhat recently because they share the C mutation, and two just has one mutation not observed in, in any of the other sequences. But three and four take a little longer to coalesce because they have these two mutations that are both private. So I can move from the sequence to the genealogy. And what's gonna be important for this kind of inference is that the length of time between these coalescent events is gonna give me information about the number of ancestral individuals to my sample. The shorter the interval, the fewer ancestors were, um, the fewer ancestors existed in the populations because my lineages kind of found each other quickly. 
So these are unobserved ancestral individuals. You might not be able to see in the back that they're gray circles. So we're going to assume that in this interval between these two coalescent times, there were sort of more ancestral individuals than down here. Okay. So that's the information that's going to give us the ability to draw this population size trajectory. And what we're going to use as sort of input into generating this or data is the density of these coalescent times over time. If you wanted to draw a graphical model of what this inference might look like, um, here's our observed data Y, and here's this coalescent um, process and a mutation process, and then we're going to put a population process prior on population size that somehow relates to the coalescent, and there might be a hyperparameter tau. So an interesting problem, um, you can do this uh, quite easily. There are lots of uh, pieces of software out of the box to do this from one locus. Probably the one some of you have heard of is Beast, um, or you know, there are Bayesian sky line and sky ride plots, lots of different ways to do this from one locus. But if you want to understand multi-locus patterns of ancestry, there's something more complicated you have to think about, and that's recombination breakpoints and how linked DNA segments, how their ancestral processes might relate to each other. Um, so this is a problem that's been around for a long time. Um, the issue is that if you have linked DNA segments, you can no longer describe their ancestry using a bifurcating tree. Instead, the different lineages can have different ancestral processes, and so you get a graph. That graph is called the ancestral recombination graph. And the way that people got traction on how to solve this problem for multiple linked loci um, was through a really nice paper by Gil McVean and Niall Carden in 2005 um, that described an approximation to the ancestral recombination graph that's called the sequentially Markov coalescent. And there's been a lot of work on this since. Um, basically, the idea is here I've got an alignment of sequences, and these dashed lines represent recombination breakpoints. So the insight of the SMC is that there's some correlation in the ancestral process when I move across a recombination breakpoint. There's a Markovian dependence in the genealogical process as I move down this chromosome. So what that means for me, if I'm trying to do inference, is that so I've got this genealogy that describes this first um, locus. And if I want to sample a genealogy that I think is will do a good job describing this second locus, I don't actually have to start from scratch. I don't have to sort of sample and decide, am I going to accept or reject this genealogy out of just the full state space of genealogies. Instead, I can say, because of this linkage, there's going to be some dependence um, between this unseen genealogy and this one that I think is true. And so what the SMC describes is taking this genealogy that's in green and pruning it, breaking it off somewhere, and then regrafting it to form a co further back in time from where we've pruned it. Um, so, so what I might produce is this sort of orangish tree that actually describes my data quite well. And in that process, what I've done is I've deleted this top coalescent event from the previous tree. That's no longer in this new tree, but I've added a new coalescent event down here, this blue one, that um, brings these three sequences together and we might find support for that in our data because of this shared um, mutation to a, to a T. So I can continue with this process, and then basically what we're going to use to generate these effective population size trajectories is if you imagine now I go to the left side of the slide and kind of push all the trees together, I'm going to take these collections of blue and red deleted and newly observed coalescent events, and that's where I'm going to get that information about effective population size over time. So many people have used the SMC in order to do inference from data. Um, a really nice paper that I shared um, with you on the CGSI uh, schedule is this kind of paradigm shifting one by Lee and Durbin in 2011, where they noted that the density of heterozygous states um, sites within a single individual or between two haplotypes gives us information about um, any in the, in the past. And since then, there have been multiple updates. Um, so PSMC is predicated on looking at two haplotypes that are aligned to each other. MSMC scales up to slightly larger sample sizes, maybe up to 10. Um, and DECAL is from Yun Song's group. Um, so some features of these approaches, which are really exciting, um, is that they assume that NE is a piecewise constant function with respect to time. Um, they also all conduct their inference via maximum likelihood. 
and that requires a discretization of time. So you basically have to be able to bin your coalescent times together. And I'm gonna talk about how that really can complicate our ability to, infer, to interpret um, these population size trajectories. And they also, um, not that one can't under a frequentist paradigm generate confidence intervals, but all of these methods really um, prioritize the ability to analyze whole genomes, which is a great, thing to do, but that means making some approximations that make measures of uncertainty very difficult to compute. Um, so that none of them really report confidence intervals. You can do bootstrapping over blocks of the genome to get confidence intervals, but I don't think any of the authors would really recommend that. I haven't heard them recommend it. Um, I'm happy to be corrected if that's wrong. Um, but they generally report just point estimates. Okay. Um, other feature of these existing methods is that they generally um, focus on changes to a genealogy only if the most recent coalescent time going back in the past is affected. Um, so if you think about your sample, the most recent event, if that time period kind of isn't altered in its bin, then a new genealogy isn't really sampled. Um, and that's a problem when you start scaling up your number of samples. So in simulation, we found that even if you just have 10 samples, only about 8% or 7% of the changes to the genealogy will affect that first coalescent time. So if you're just using that kind of approximation to gain whole genome tractability, in analysis, you might be ignoring a lot of the distant past. So some of these methods will be good for the more recent past, and other approaches might be better for the distant past. Um, and another kind of small detail, but for those of you who are interested, is that many of these methods also ignore invisible recombination events, which occur but do not change the genealogy, although MSMC um, is based on this model SMC prime that, that does not ignore these. Okay. All right, so we wanted to overcome some of these limitations, um, and we wanted to do it in a Bayesian way by using Bayesian nonparametrics. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Bayesian nonparametrics, um, it's different from kind of standard classic nonparametric tests you might have learned about. Um, a Bayesian nonparametric approach is a model kind of on an infinite dimensional parameter space. And I should say, this work is by a very excellent postdoc of mine, Julia Palacios, who's now starting a faculty job at Stanford. Um, we were sad to lose her, but yeah, she really drove this project. So what we wanted to do um, is to use the full genealogy for the inference of effective population size trajectories. Um, we really wanted to avoid the user-specified discretization of time, and we did this by assuming a Gaussian process prior on any of t. And so the reason why we need Bayesian nonparametrics to do this is that we're still gonna think of any as piecewise constant, but if we have many, many, many change points, like hundreds, thousands of change points, let's say hundreds, um, you can approximate this continuous function with respect to time really well if you have that many change points. And it's the Bayesian approach that's gonna allow us to not increase the complexity of inference by having that many parameters. It also allows us to very easily incorporate temporal autocorrelation and population size into inference, which can be done in a frequentist approach, but it's quite natural with a Gaussian process prior. And it lets us produce measures of uncertainty quite easily with credibility intervals. Okay. Um, so in the paper, what we do, uh, which is not really what we want, we want to do more, and I'll tell you about our efforts for that, but what we do is we conduct this Bayesian nonparametric inference of any from sequential genealogies. So now forget about sequence data. And let's say that you have a model where you somehow know truly what the local genealogies are that generated your data. Okay, so you've got the genealogies and that means you also know the breakpoints. So that's what this graphical model is saying. What you need to infer are the pruning locations, how exactly you transition from G0 to G1, and then you're gonna get some information based on uh, about any of t, and then you have a hyperparameter for precision. Um, so you can learn a lot about this posterior distribution of any of t and tau given these genealogies. Um, and just this is kind of a sort of standard form of equation, but I want you to understand the terms. So this is the posterior. This is going to be proportional to understanding the probability of observing the first genealogy just under the standard coalescent, and then all the transition um, transitions from genealogy to genealogy moving in space from left to right, and then your priors, and our prior for any of t is going to be a log Brownian motion Gaussian prior. So here's what results look like in simulation. 
So let's say that our truth is that we have a constant population size over time. Um, now is the rightmost uh, part of the graph and the distant past is the leftmost. Um, and we have 100 genealogies and they have 20, uh, 20 individuals, 20 tips. So I'm going to show you the difference between the frequentist inference from the full genealogy versus, versus ours. Um, so here's what our EM gives us with 95% confidence intervals. Um, we have to specify a number of breakpoints, and so that's obviously affecting what's happening here, but I'll talk about why um, I can't choose like hundreds of breakpoints for this function, so I'm getting this kind of um, piecewise constant sort of change that, that actually looks quite dramatic in some places. Um, but with the Gaussian process, we can have lots of change points and not, not kind of increase complexity for inference, and so we actually recover the truth quite nicely. Um, you also can see from our credibility intervals a feature that you should see, which is that we have more uncertainty about any of T going further back in time, and that's because those intercoalescent intervals will just get longer as you go further back in the tree. Um, similarly, if we look at a pair of individuals, so kind of a PSMC style approach, but with many genealogies, 5,000, um, and the truth is sort of, uh, so it might be hard to see it, like exponential growth with a plateau, you can probably guess that that's what's happening with the frequentist approach, but it's sort of much more jagged, and with the Bayesian approach, you can really approximate a kind of smoother function more easily. Um, Lastly, with a bottleneck, again, you can you kind of play with the discretization to get this to happen, but I just want to show you what can happen that can be difficult to deal with. Um, you can actually become very certain that your bottleneck occurred at the wrong time. So here there was a bottleneck right here for this duration, and I think now based on my inference that it actually was further back in time and longer and maybe less dramatic. Um, but with our approach, you might not get the timing exactly right of the recovery of the population size, but you can detect this sudden change in the recent past quite well, um, which is a neat feature, I think, of the Bayesian nonparametric approach. Um, so since this is a tutorial, uh, if you go to this website, ramachandran-data.brown.edu, under all data, we've released scripts from this um, paper, and we have a knitter notebook that shows you how, with simulated genealogies from Max, you could do this kind of inference and produce these skyline plots. So it's a dynamic document that you can alter, and the, the helper scripts are available. And you should let me know if you have any questions. Um, so, why exactly does this Gaussian process-based method recover the truth more easily? Um, well, one reason is that under the EM approach, as existing studies implement it, you have to specify a grid of change points, and that's your number of parameters. The more parameters you have, um, the more complicated your inference gets. And the problem with the EM is that it may not converge, it's unlikely to converge um, if there are no coalescent events in certain intervals. So if I have a lot of change points, I'm gonna have time periods where I don't observe any data from my genealogies on any of T. And then I get this kind of a plot, which is known as runaway behavior. I have no information about any, so it looks like it was infinite at that time. You can kind of hack your way through and say, well, what if I just interpolate from this segment and this segment? I can just assume these are autocorrelated. And you can do that, and then you'll get a picture that might look kind of sensible. Um, and this is for 10 change points in this population size trajectory. But if I change my grid and I make it five change points, now I get a population size trajectory for the same history from the same genealogies that I think I might interpret very differently. Okay. So that's the sort of caveat about this that, um, that I really want you to kind of take home. Um, we can apply this to data. Um, we can do it with data dating the human expansion out of Africa, which many of these studies have looked at. So in this example, we use a two megabase region on chromosome one that's very far from genes. Um, it was also used by Sarah Sheehan and Kelly Harris and Yun Song in their paper with releasing decal. These are samples from the 1,000 genomes, uh, five individuals of European descent and five from West Africa, from Nigeria. And this is a hacky way to do this. We, don't, we wanna implement inference from data, but one approach you can take with kind of heavy caution from me is that you can infer genealogies using Adam Siepel's group's uh, method, Argweaver. 
from your data and then use those genealogies with our script. Um, but I'll show you why you might not want to do that. So one, so here's what we get. So here we have a, in blue our population size trajectory with pr uh, credible intervals for the African samples and in green for the Europeans. So if you look, you can see that if you're using the measures of uncertainty, maybe around 50,000 to 100,000 years ago, um, those are really start to overlap and become completely intertwined. So maybe you can start to say that um, if you look just at the point estimates around 75,000 years ago, but maybe more like 50,000 years ago, the European lineages were expanding um, out of Africa and, um, and into the rest of the world. Okay. So the, the caveat I have about using Argweaver as kind of a stopgap to get from data to, to the R approach is you see these oscillations that are happening back here that come because Argweaver itself is, is discretizing time. So if you don't have data about any of T, then you get this sort of, um, in certain bins, you get this kind of oscillation in, in your estimates that might be difficult to, to understand in the distant past. Okay, so what's difficult about doing this from data? Um, well, what's really complicated is the state space of the genealogies. There are a lot of genealogies. Um, if we know the genealogies, this likelihood, which everything I showed you up until now is predicated on, is quite tractable. It's very easy um, to calculate. But our goal is really to infer the full posterior distribution of the population size trajectory and the genealogies and the mutations in the hyperparameter. So the issue is that the state space of genealogies involves thinking about all the ways your coalescent times could be distributed along a genealogy and then all the possible labeled topologies of n samples. And the cardinality of this is a big number, it's got factorials and a big power of two at the bottom. But to understand numbers, if you have 100 samples, the total number of labeled topologies you could have is 10 to the 284. And the total number of atoms in the universe is approximately 10 to the 80. So you need much longer than a doctoral dissertation to try to think about exploring this state space. So one of the contributions of this paper that we think will let us get traction on this is that we found that transition densities, when you look at this model of the SMC with invisible recombination, do not depend on labeled topologies. But they depend on another quantity that hasn't been talked a lot about in population genetics since it was first described in the 80s. Um, and these are local ranked tree shapes and coalescent times. And so Tajima actually described these in 1983. Um, they've been called vintaged and sized coalescence, but they haven't been sort of brought into the literature that commonly. Um, but these are sufficient statistics for inferring N E of T. And the cardinality of this state space is a super exponential reduction from labeled topologies. So here, I think not having population structure and having exchangeability of lineages is really important, um, which is a limitation. But to give you a sense of the numbers, um, here are some sample sizes. So for five um, individuals, there are 180 labeled topologies, but only five ranked tree shapes. Uh, for 10 individuals, there are just under 8,000 ranked tree shapes. You could actually explore all of those, right, exhaustively. For 20, the numbers get big. You're looking at um, 10 to the 29 labeled topologies versus 10 to the 13. But this is total number of possible topologies. So I'm not using the Markovian dependence of the SMC to, I can reduce the state space much further. So we think that this is really going to allow us um, to actually implement an algorithm for inference from data. Just to give a few details, um, if we want to do exploration using MCMC for the posterior, um, then we use this log Gaussian process prior. Uh, we're going to use a Riemann approximation to compute the likelihood. And the thing I really want to say is that um, we use a split Hamiltonian Monte Carlo sampling algorithm that's described in this paper, um, is used in this paper nicely in 2015 to jointly explore the space of N, E of T and tau. So what split HMC lets us do is we can propose an entire vector of population size changes across all those time change points and tau at once, instead of sort of changing one thing at a time like you might do with Gibbs sampling. Okay. Um, all right, so I wanna move on to my second story. So I told you about this framework. Um, and we think that ranked tree shapes will give us traction and really doing this from data. Um, all right, so um, why might we care about demographic history if we're not really interested in sort of 
history. Um, well, one reason we should also care is because it gives us a null model on which we can conditionally model selection. If we really want to understand how selection is shaping genomic variation, we should understand what's happening um, sort of neutrally as a background to shape the genome. And again, for our species, this is quite interesting because our ancestors had to take on a lot of new challenges. Um, they had to take on new diets. They faced new pathogens. And they had genetic changes that they evolved um, that were essential for their success. And we know about some of these canonical examples. So um, reduced malaria susceptibility in individuals who live in malaria zones has evolved. Um, light skin pigmentation at northern latitudes has evolved. There are lots of great classic traits. There are traits that we have induced in organisms that we depend on, like cattle um, and dogs. And what's neat, I think, about working in the genomic era is that we really need statistical approaches to identify these beneficial mutations in humans, um, where linkage studies are going to be very complicated and we can't do sort of crosses and all the nice things with yeast that we heard about yesterday from Leonid. Um, so what are the genomic signatures of adaptation that we might look for to try to classify a site as adaptive? Well, I'm going to focus on hard adaptive sweeps. Um, and the way I'll define that is that there's a de novo beneficial mutation shown by this lightning bolt here. So these are schematics of a bunch of haplotypes. And let's say that the black hashes are um, the markers I might observe in my data set. So I might not exactly observe this adaptive mutation, but I observe things that are around it. And these might be single nucleotides. And then this mutation is so beneficial that it increases in frequency eventually. It's going to fix in my population. Everyone will have it. And it's going to drag the mutations that are tightly linked to it to high frequencies. And recombination might break up other more distant associations. Um, so I might only observe these hitchhiking mutations in a sort of genotype array. When I taught this to some undergrads recently, one of them said that these hitchhiking neutral mutations are like the best friend of someone who becomes super famous super fast. So these are the like Nicole Richies of population genetics, right? <laughs> I have to think of a like modern update to that. <laughs> All right. Um, so, so, what it, so if we think about the genomic signatures of an adaptive sweep, um, we have long haplotypes that are shared among individuals. Um, we might get a lot of information based on comparing populations. So we might have a sense that an adaptive mutation is local to an environment or to a particular subsistence strategy, so we want geographic differentiation. Um, and we also might want to incorporate the site frequency spectrum and try to look at an excess frequency, excess of low and high frequency derived alleles. Um, so for those of you who haven't worked with the SFS, it's the distribution of derived allele frequencies um, in a sample. And so here's what it might look like under neutrality. We have good predictions of what it should look like. And under selection, you can basically think of hitchhiking as pushing down that middle part of this probability mass. And so you have to inflate it at the edges. So you get more fixed mutations than you would expect and also more rare frequency mutations. So I guess the tutorial part of this is to tell you what a pipeline looks like when people conduct statistical scans for adaptive mutations from genomic data. Um, so generally what happens is that most studies will choose a signature and they'll choose a statistic that's a measure for that signature. Um, this might be something like FST, the integrated haplotype statistic, or, or others that you may have heard of. Um, and they'll obtain that statistics empirical distribution across loci and then focus on the loci in the tails. Be very conservative and tell you know, a nice series of stories. Um, they might do this with two different measures and then look at a sort of Venn diagram approach of loci that are identified as outliers by multiple statistics. The problem with this approach is that if we're really trying to generate um, targets for downstream molecular validation, then we don't really know if even stringent statistical significance has anything to do with biological significance. Um, we also, I'll show you, and, and it's going to be true, that single statistics aren't going to carry a lot of power. So an outlier test that just looks at one measure is not necessarily going to give you a lot of um, the true positives that are in your data set. And genomic scans for selection generally ignore population history, um, partly because it can be hard to have a good model, which I totally respect. Um, but it's important to understand that population history can generate very similar genomic signatures to those of adaptive evolution. Just to show you an example, here's um, kit ligand and a mutation in it. 
um, that's thought to produce lighter skin pigmentation in non-Africans, which is uh, thought to be adaptive. This is really nice work from Graham Coop. Um, he was a postdoc that was in, in plus genetics. So, so here you're looking at, in the HGDP, the Human Genome Diversity Panel, the frequency of the ancestral allele in blue and the derived allele um, in orange in a series of globally distributed populations. And so you can see the derived allele has very high frequencies outside of Africa, but not in Africa. Um, and we know that this is a really likely to be a very functionally adaptive mutation, but the problem is that this pattern looks the same as a pattern you might identify with just a random SNP from these populations. So if you were doing a genomic scan for outliers, you might not be likely to classify this mutation as adaptive if you were somehow using all of these populations. Okay. So what can we do to improve on thinking about detecting adaptive mutations? Well, we might want to combine multiple and ideally independent genomic signatures to gain power. Um, we might, instead of using arbit arbitrary thresholds, doing things like von Prony correcting or looking in extreme tails of a distribution, we might actually want kind of a probabilistically interpretable result. Um, we want to make sure that we can calculate this across many sites. Some of these statistics will be undefined at certain sites, and it'd be nice to not have to worry about that if we're using multiple statistics. Um, and we want to model population history and avoid the, its confounding effect. So we have a new approach that uses a pipeline that other people have used. Um, it's kind of a demography-aware pipeline. Kirk Lohmuller and John Novambe's group have, have also thought about this um, with canids. And what we do is we rely on simulations from a known model for population history. So the pipeline goes something, wow. sorry, like this. Um, first, we simulate a one megabase, like many one, one megabase genomic regions from a model with and without this beneficial mutation, this star here. So you might do this with a, you could do it with a former si forward simulator. Um, we do it with a coalescent one, with COSI. Um, then you calculate a series of summary statistics in each simulated neutral region and each simulated region undergoing selection from a de novo mutation. Um, and then you learn the distributions of your summary statistics, your N, the joint distribution of N of them, under a sweep and under neutrality from this training data set. Okay. Um, so this is work by another excellent postdoc of mine, uh, Lauren Sugden. And what we did initially is the most naive thing you can do, which is just to say all these statistics are independent from each other if I know the site's class. If, and then I can use Bayes' rule and calculate the exact posterior probability that a site is the site of a sweep. And the way I'm going to do that is say, OK, so I want the probability a sweep occurred at this site given a set of n statistics observed at that site. And I have some prior um, per site on the fact that there's adaptation there. You can modify your prior. You could say if it's in a gene, your prior changes. If it's far from a gene, it you know, becomes zero or something. Um, and you have these products of likelihoods um, over all the statistics. So, so how do we calculate the likelihoods? Those are what are learned via simulation. So we have all these different conditions simulated, and then we know the probability of observing particular values for each statistic. One, exam uh, one advantage of this approach is that if you can't compute one of the underlying statistics because it's undefined at a site, then you can still compute this posterior. You just leave that statistic out. Um, other similar approaches don't have this feature. Okay. So what we can then do is look at our data and we can say, okay, if the probability of a sweep given what I'm observing in my data at these summary statistics is more than 50% or some other threshold, I'm going to say this is where a sweep occurs. So this is a naive Bayes classifier, kind of the simplest classifier you could build. Then we did another machine learning um, update to this, kind of a new approach. So what we do is we control for pairwise dependencies among the individual statistics in our classifier. So here I'm showing you in simulations contra plots of um, the joint histograms of observed values of delta IHH, which is related to the integrated haplotype statistic. Um, this is introduced by Party Sabetti's group and FST. So if you think about the marginals of each of these things, you can see that FST is maybe good at separating out neutrality from a sweep, fairly good, maybe not so good in here. Um, but delta IHH might have some problems if I'm just looking at the marginal. But together, if I know the joint values of these statistics, I can actually do a pretty good job um, classifying. So the joint likelihood might be more informative than the, the individual ones. 
Um, and so we can incorporate this into inference using something called a one dependence estimator framework. The idea there being that if we know the value of one statistic, we're going to assume that every other statistic's value is um, conditionally independent given that statistic's value. And you can average over all of this to reduce your variance. So now I'll show you um, how our classifier looks um, compared to an existing composite method, but also to the single statistics that make it up. So this is a receiver operating characteristic curve I'm going to show you. So here, the way I'm defining power is in this one megabase region under selection, there's one site where the beneficial mutation occurred. And I want to identify that site correctly. Okay, um, And I'm going to show you false positive rate on the x-axis. So, here um, are a series of statistics you might know, IHS, delta IHH, FST in blue, um, derived, difference in derived allele frequency, and the green um, curve represents CMS, um, first delineated by Grossman et al. in 2010. Um, so here's our method. And I think it's really important to think about how these kinds of scans actually work and that when we look at these rock curves, we really want to be focusing on like really zooming into this part of the graph because if I'm scanning a chip that has 750,000 SNFs, I don't want 2% false positives, right? If I'm talking to a collaborator about what to follow up on, I'd like to get like very few false positives. So we think that the gains that we're making are really interesting and, and where they're coming from is thinking kind of more probabilistically about how to compute this post exterior um, than other approaches are. Um, so now what's interesting is instead of thinking about this as a classifier, we can actually just plot these posterior probabilities across regions. And so if we just use genomic data, we could look at known targets of selection and try to localize the putatively adaptive SNP. So here I'm going to show you just a couple of results. Um, so this is from SLC45A2. This is a known um, gene under adaptive evolution in humans and in a number of other organisms. It mediates melanin synthesis. Mutations in it are known to produce light skin in humans, and also um, mutations in it produce horses that have this palomino or cremello coloration of sort of whiteness and blonde hair. Um, so here's what we find if we go along this, this window, and we're we're sort of doing p-values a little bit on, um, not p-values, we're doing kind of converting CMS into probabilities, but basically what we find is that in this gene, our classifier identifies a few sites that are linked that have a high posterior probability of being under selection, and the one that achieves the highest probability is actually the known kind of functionally um, important mutation. So we think this is really exciting. Um, in genes that are thought to be under strong selection, but where there's not necessarily a putative causal SNP, we can also con conduct this kind of scan. So here we're looking at CD36. Um, it binds a lot of ligands, including erythrocytes that are parasitized with Plasmodium falciparum. Um, this is thought to be under selection, but again, the adaptive variant is unknown. Um, so here we identify a number of potential targets of selection that we think could be quite interesting to follow up, but that other methods might miss. And generally in our genome scan, we find um, enrichment for transcription factor binding sites and regulatory regions upstream of genes, which might be quite interesting to explore further. Um, okay, so I've told you about another way that we can use kind of Bayesian approach um, to think about combining statistics to identify candidate sites um, that are adaptive in the genome. And if somebody wants to ask me about CMS, I can tell you a little more about this, but um, our, our approach is really quite particularly interesting under um, a biological scenario I think is important, which is sweeps that are very recent and strong or sweeps that are fixed. So a lot of these sweep statistics become undefined when a sweep is fixed. And because you can ignore um, those component statistics and computation in our approach, we can actually still detect those. Um, and I think it's also important in these selection scans to understand that different statistics, different features are going to be useful, right, in different scenarios. And so I think this one dependence estimation framework um, can really be interesting to provide guidelines for trying to understand what type of sweep you're trying to look for in your data. So we're sort of curious about that. Which features are going to be most useful for genome scans that you might want to um, conduct? 
So I'll just close by saying if you don't um, work on humans, I apologize for all the human examples, but there are lots of organisms that have histories that are really intertwined with our own and diseases that are similar. Uh, some of these we carry with us, like Helicobacter pylori, which shows a decrease in heterozygosity with distance from Africa, like humans do. Um, Mycobacterium TB has been shown via effective population size trajectories to have left Africa along with humans and undergone an expansion during the Neolithic. Um, and lots of us have animals that you know, have been domesticated with us. This is my family's dog. And uh, so we might care about animals like that. Um, and I'll just thank my lab and shamelessly say that we're always looking for great people to join the lab. So if you're interested in what we do, talk to me about opportunities to become part of it. Thanks a lot. <laughs>